Okay. All right, you guys, thank you so much for joining us for our quarter four webinar. And I'm so grateful to these incredible like rock star ladies who have decided to join in and just be part of this conversation uh, where we can talk about just what does it look like to be an advocate for ocular for ocular melanoma? And also, you know, what does this look like for people uh, kind of in various stages of this disease, right? Um, so without further ado, I actually want to start with uh, introducing you to the, the people who are here on this panel. So first up, I have Lauren Seaman, who is the vice president of the board of Acure Insight. And she is an ocular, melanoma, an ocular melanoma survivor herself. She's absolutely incredible. If you have not had a chance to connect with her, make sure to connect. Um, next up, uh, I guess I'm going kind of like from around my screen. So I guess if my screen looks the same as yours, then below Lauren, you'll see Ashley McCrary, who is also another rock star in this, this realm of ocular melanoma. She's one of the first patients that I came across uh, online because she has such a strong social media presence. And she has been so open and authentic and sharing her story um, through all of the ups and downs. And I just remember her reaching out to me um, when I was diagnosed and she is one of the most compassionate people you will meet. So again, if you haven't reached out to her and connected with her, do so. She's always there to connect and she's always happy to um, link up with new patients or you know anyone who's just finding this platform. I don't know, how, wherever you are in your diagnosis. And then finally, below uh, my below my screen, I have patient um, Kristen McDonald, who is joining us from Chicago, if I'm correct. Yes, and I forgot to say where you guys are all from, but um, but yes, Lauren is or Kristen is joining us, and she is uh, a really honestly very young patient, and you're gonna have to share a little bit more about that story, but um, but she is one of the people who has been like front and front and center with the steps in sight movement that we have done the last couple of years. And she has had one of the largest teams every single year. She's raised some of the most money for ocular melanoma um, within a cure insight. And we are so grateful to have you here. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually have you guys each go around and just tell us a little more about your story. Um, so I'm going to start with Lauren because Lauren, you have technically been around, around the block the longest with this diagnosis. So go ahead and tell us more about, you know, your history with ocular melanoma. First of all, I want to thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, it's truly an honor and an honor to be with these two rock stars down there and you um, also and I wish everybody a happy, healthy holiday. It's the holiday, so stay close to your loved ones. Um, as you know, my name is Lauren Seaman and I was diagnosed in 2001. And when I was diagnosed, there was no social media. So I was in this pool of uh, ocular melanoma all by myself, really. Um, I had my family and that was it. There was no really a lot of information about it. Um, and there was no uh, support system. So when I was diagnosed, um, I had plaque radiation to my left eye. Uh, back then they'd keep you in the hospital. They didn't have biopsy then like they do today. Um, <clears throat> when the radiologist met with me, he, the first thing he said to me was, I want you to go live your life. My ocular oncologist did the surgery, but the radiologist, you know, he, he makes the seeds that go on the plaque. And he said, I just want you to go live your life, show up to your appointments when you're supposed to be there and don't worry about it. That's what they said to me. And that's what I did one day at a time. I am, I was diagnosed um, in 2001. I am now 60. I'm going to be 65. So I'm the oldest one on this panel, you guys. I mean, like I'm, I'm hitting the old <laughs> and truly blessed. Um, so there was nothing for me as far as connection with other ocular melanoma survivors. What happened is um, I went on and lived my life. Um, I had a career uh, got married, had a beautiful husband, and lived my life to the fullest. Um, and then in 2017, I had a stroke in the good eye, which is the right eye, and I went blind for a while. And um, what happened was, and this is funny, I was just telling Ashley, is it was uh, beginning of 2018, the cancer eye decided it was jealous of the uh, stroke eye, and it decided, you know what? I'm going to start hemorrhaging because of radiation retinopathy so many years later. 
So um, I've been aggr aggressively treated. Um, I am blessed. I do not have metastatic disease. Um, keep praying. Um, but I have other issues with my eyes. And what happened was I was alone again in this, this journey and I couldn't work anymore. And my brother had called me, said, there's these gals on uh, Dr. Oz and um, they have ocular wow. melanoma. And I said to my brother, there's no way they have ocular melanoma because it's so rare. It's a rare cancer. And sure enough, it was Ashley and, and her, her, her sisters. And, and basically they were in recovery at that time. And um, so I connected with Ashley and somehow that led me to, I did a video, it was in May, it was eye patch time and asked for donations for her, her, not, her charity. And then somehow I met a cure in sight and then all's history. I've been with a cure in sight. Um, I went to their first event in um, 2018 of December, it was in Disney. And I met all these wonderful, beautiful, uh, ocular melanoma survivors, thrivers, we're thrivers, guys. And I wanted to be a part of it. And so that's how I got started. So Lauren, thank you so much. That was incredible to hear. Um, and I feel like I've heard bits and pieces of this story, but I don't know that I've ever heard it kind of all pulled together like that. So thank you so much for honoring us with that. Um, and for being here. And for those of you joining in live, um, please ask questions if you have them. And, uh, just cheer on our panelists here from afar if you're watching in virtually. So Lauren, thank you again for, for your story. Um, we're going to move over to Ashley McCrary so that she can just tell us a little about her history with ocular melanoma and where that look or what that looked like a while ago and kind of how it's changed and evolved and when, how she is doing today. Well, Danae, just like Lauren said, I'm just so thankful to be a part of this panel and to be alongside these other women and um, I'm excited we get to do this today and hopefully we can answer people's questions and whatnot. But um, to be concise with my story, I was actually diagnosed in 2012. I lived in Memphis at the time. Um, you, you could see the tumor in my eye. It's a ciliary body tumor, but it had grown forward. So you could actually see it in my iris, which is how I, uh, I had a friend that had noticed it, the, the spots in my eye. And so um, upon diagnosis, I found out that my tumor was very large and thick. Um, probably been there obviously for a while. So I had my eye enucleated. Um, and at the time I can remember telling my doctor, you know, I knew two other women who I had gone to Auburn with who had this cancer. And of course he was like, there's no way, um, this is so rare. I'm sure it's not the same thing. And, and as those of you who know my story know that it was true, <laughs> that, um, that actually there was a unique grouping of people is what we call ourselves um, out of Auburn, Alabama, uh, who had this cancer. So fast forward, um, I was actually put on, you know, surveillance uh, because we did have the Castle diagnostic test at that time. And I was a class two um, on the Castle test. And so my, my surveillance was every three to four months for the first five years. Um, and then I moved to Auburn, Alabama, believe it or not, we moved back to Auburn because our family is here. And, um, and in 2020, October of 2020, so it had been eight years since my initial diagnosis, just on my routine scans, which at that point were um, an, an MRI and CAT scans every six months. I'd gone to a six month surveillance and um, I went from no tumors in February of 2020 to innumerable tumors um, in October of, of 2020. And um, of course diagnosed here in Auburn and they knew that they couldn't treat it here because of what Lauren was talking about with this unique group of people that, that had gone to Auburn and had this cancer, you know, at that time there were 38 of us. Um, there, there was a lot of national attention to that. And I had done several TV shows, um, today show, NBC nightly news, CBS this morning, Dr. Oz, we were in people magazine, all of those, uh, um, were, we were accompanied by some of the doctors in Philadelphia, specifically Marlena Orloff. So when I was diagnosed in October 2020, I knew her very well. She and I had become just really good friends, and I knew that that's where I would be treated. So I went through eight months of um, immunoembolization, and at first uh, I could see it working in the first several months, but then after eight months we realized it wasn't working, and I had innumerable new tumors. And I was fortunate that Dr. Sato decided to, in, in October, 
um, when they biopsied and they did other blood work and whatnot, and I found that I was praying positive and HLA-2 positive. And uh, so when I, I knew that I was going to need a course of treatment change, uh, I was very fortunate to be put at the top of the praying trial list. And so I started the praying trial in uh, July of 2021. I just finished my 127th week of praying. So I go to Philadelphia once a week. I'm very fortunate um, that, that I'm able to do that. But in February of this year, so February of 2023, I had three rogue tumors that just started doing their own thing. And at the time, we were, there were 16 or 17 of us uh, that were OM patients, not cutaneous melanoma, but OM, that were on the PRAIM trial. Um, now there's only one who's exclusively just PRAIM. But all of us had progression about 80, 90 weeks in to, to our PRAIM um, treatment. And that was about this, that time for me. And uh, so I had some rogue tumors that we had radiated. I had one actually that was radiated. And then I had further progression in May of this year where I have two um, tumors in my lungs. And we added Tevi in July of 2023. So I've, I just finished my 25th, I think, um, skin track or Tevi uh, infusion. And my scans the last time were good. I was very encouraged. Um, everything was stable. And I had some of my liver tumors that had actually shrunk, one that had shrunk in half. Um, with the addition of, of Chemtrack, so I was very excited about that, and I have scans on Monday, so y'all can pray for me going into the holiday. Um, as we all know, that can be somewhat uh, stressful, but I feel like I'm doing really well um, with people like Kristen, because I, I was able to reach out to her. She was she was my uh, mentor going into the Chemtrack um, and telling me what to expect and how to do, and she, uh, you know, has been on this over a year, so it's been encouraging to see her, um, so Anyway, I, I feel like I'm doing really well in a good headspace now as we just look forward to hopefully years and years to come. Ashley, thank you so much. That was incredible to just hear you um, sum it up, so to speak, because I mean, I've, I've followed your journey for a pretty long time. I feel like I've known you basically since you encountered metastatic disease. Um, and so, cause I think it, that happened like within a couple of months of me being diagnosed is that you were like, oh, and now I have metastatic disease, by the way. <laughs> Um, so thank you for sharing and thank you for, uh, just, I really, I mean, I, I really appreciate both you and Lauren and Kristen all being here. Um, I think that one of the biggest things I hope our, our listeners can take away from, from this specific webinar is just hope, like, and just to see, to see the, the four of us, like standing, like three of us who have now dealt with metastatic disease, one who is a 20 plus year survivor of of ocular melanoma to begin with, and has also survived blindness in the other eye. Like there's, there's so much that we have overcome. Like we are literally all four of all four of us on this call are overcomers. Like, and I think that really we could argue every single patient with ocular melanoma is one of those people. And, um, so I just, I hope that people can take away the hope from seeing your stories and hearing where you are today, despite all of the obstacles that you've dealt with coming up to now. Um, so with that, Kristen, let's talk a little about your obstacles because I know they have been crazy. Yes. Thank you again for inviting me to join this. It's so great to hear all of your stories. Um, my story kind of began back in 2020. I experienced uh, a wide variety of different uh, symptoms before being diagnosed with ocular melanoma. And so if we all think of 2020, the first thing that comes to mind is COVID. Um, so it was the year of the COVID and it was the year I was home, uh, work from home and had a lot of flexibility to go to a lot of eye doctors to try to figure out what was going on with this left eye. I kind of experienced some blackouts in the left eye, um, a crazy high eye pressure of 50, which normally it's supposed to be in the 10 to 20 range. And so my eye doctors were all pretty stumped. They were convinced that I may have had uh, glaucoma. We did a tube shunt to relieve the pressure, but when that didn't change anything, we knew there was something um, bigger at large. Uh, so I ended up seeing another doctor elsewhere and they were able to discover that uh, there were tumor cells in my eye, similar to Ashley, where it you could almost see them on the iris, which was shocking to me because I had seen so many eye doctors at this point. Um, but I made a quick appointment to go see Dr. Shields in Philadelphia, and she did a biopsy, confirmed that it was ocular melanoma of ciliary body um, in 2021. And then it was a pretty quick decision uh, to go the route of nucleation, which is losing the eye. 
Um, just because I had that tube shunt history and a tube that was a pathway out from inside the eye of where these tumor cells could travel. So my treatment options were pretty unique. And especially at a younger age, I jumped into both the nucleation and then the radiation um, of, I did some radiation to my orbit um, preventatively in case there were tumor cells floating out there. And then um, I was looking at adjuvant trial options, which is what Danae experienced as well. We both did VPA symptom at Jefferson Hospital and got connected with those folks pretty quickly in the process. Um, the requirement was like within six months of diagnosis. So I knew that I needed to make that connection fast. Um, and then even before that, being a younger patient, I chose to go the route of egg freezing and just be like, I don't know. It seems like this thing's really rare. We don't really have a lot out there. So that was important to me to make that decision at that stage too. Um, and after all of these kind of 2021 instances happened, I got connected with Akira Insight um, and met this awesome group of patients and uh, stories of encouragement and started to learn about what the treatment options were out there. I've heard a lot about trials. Um, I met Ashley and Lauren and Danae and had some real connections that I could meet with on Tuesday nights. Um, and, you know, it was unique too. I also think of my COVID experience like that. We were all on Zoom, but I was also all on Zoom doing a cured site at night. And so <laughs> it was a really unique time in social media. And, you know, that added to my journey too. So uh, fast forward, I did a year of the adjuvant uh trial and then I did metastasize to the liver. Um, but I was armed already with so much information about what was out there, what people were encouraged and excited about. And so pretty quickly I started um Kim Track to Bentifus, um, which is weekly infusions. And I am now uh 17 months stable on the treatment. So still doing them weekly and did number 67 this week. So um, I'm really encouraged to see all the advances, not even Kim Track alone, but there's a lot coming out and there's, it's, yeah, like Danae said, hopefully other patients can take away a lot of hope from these stories. Kristen, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Um, you guys are honestly, I mean, just three of some really powerful advocates that we see for ocular melanoma in the, the social media space and in um, really just in the advocacy space for cancer in general, because we, um, and I think maybe we have a little bit more of an inside look at this because we're a little bit more heavily involved, but but we are an orphan cancer. And so in the realm of or of rare diseases, that means that there's really not a whole lot of, of funding. There's not a lot of legislation. Most people don't know what this disease is unless they have it or a friend gets it, or maybe a family, you know, a family member or a friend who ends up with this disease. And other than that, the majority of the world of cancer, you know, with the let's cure cancer has no idea this cancer even exists. And so advocacy from patients like you, um, who come on and are, are willing to share your stories are willing to, to push the word out there about, you know, what is ocular melanoma to be part of a cure in sight, like Lauren began to have, um, an online social media presence where you talk about, you know, your, your social media, or sorry, your experience with various different treatments and sharing where you are and sharing how important it is to have eye exams. Um, all of those different pieces, they, um, they have what we call the compound effect. And so that, that essentially means that, you know, you guys are three people, but because of your efforts, all of what you have done has trickled out, right? And I talk with my hands, I'm sorry. I'm like hitting my microphone that I'm not used to having because it works now. But uh, but the this this idea of the compound effect is that, you know, essentially you, you guys are that one person and that ripple effect of what you're doing and how you're you're conveying this this advocacy, it starts to just expand like around you without you even really having to try. So I want to just ask you guys, what does being your own advocate mean? What does that mean to, to be your own advocate in the world of ocular melanoma? Kind of just having that as a, as a baseline that it's such a rare cancer. Most people don't know about it. Um, so Lauren, why don't you start and tell us um, what does being your own advocate look like? So first of all, you're talking about, I'm, I'm getting all teary eyed because here's the thing. I'm doing well. Thank you, God. And, and I, 
my passion is to get the word out. I've been on TV like Ashley. Um, you know, I you were saying like it's the orphan cancer. I go to the doctor and they look at you like you have six heads. Nobody, they don't know what it is. And you start telling them. And I sometimes I feel like I'm, you know, Snoopy, wah, 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 because they're going, yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're not listening. No, they're not listening. And, and we have to be the voice. We need each other. And so we need each one of you to help us to get the word out because people need to know. We need to get people to get their eyes dilated and checked. The sooner you get your eyes checked, listen, mine was found in a, I, I wore contact lenses, which I don't anymore. I went to one of those little opticians, you know, those storefront places and the guy saw a lesion. Now he saved my life. And, and so we've got to get the word out, but we also need to raise money for research. Look at these two. There was no cure before. We need a cure. We need, we need to get the word out. We need to help our friends. And so it's my passion. Every time I walk in it somewhere and I'm trying to get some funding for us, I start crying because we've lost so many friends along the way. And we don't have to anymore. We all need each other. I need every one of you, whoever's watching, you guys, we need you to step up. Get Start walking, come to the walks, do the steps for sight, tell your friends. It, it's, you know, like I've got a friend right now. She, I just met this woman. She, she started these, they're lovebirds. And, and they're blue and they got a white eye for us and they're on a black band for ocular melanoma. She's raising money for us. We've got to tell everyone we know. No, that's such, that's such a I good just, point. I love I, what you said. And, 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 and one more thing, hope. You know what hope means? Hope is spelled H-O-P-E. Hold on, peace exists. Hold on, you guys, we can do this. We got to do this together though. We can't do it alone. We need each other. So yeah. we need you. So Thank I love you, you all. Thanks. I Thank don't you. get me going, girl. No, you're you're so passionate. And I hope that I hope that the people listening, um, whether now live in the recording, uh, I hope that they can just take away some of that passion because that is that's what makes things move forward. You know, things, things like Kim track being approved, the FDA approval, those kinds of, you know, monumental things that happen in our realm of cancer, they don't happen alone. They happen because of voices who are speaking out and who are publicly letting doctors and, and pharmaceutical companies know, Hey, we matter. Like we matter. We are important. And we're important enough to invest in. We're important enough to pay attention to and to to understand, you know, what is happening and why and and to see if we can figure out um, answers. So thank you, Lauren, for sharing. Ashley, um, let's go ahead and have you go next. What does advocacy look like for you? Like in your, you have weekly appointments. Um, how does it look in family relationships? And um, maybe we can talk a little more about online as well, because I know you've done some, some unique interviews online. <laughs> Well, I will tell you, I, I just echo Sweet Lauren just about, um, I think we were all created for impact. You know, we're not, we're not in this vacuum. Um, everything that we do in life can, can impact the life of another person. And so there are probably people watching this who are like, okay, I'm, I just don't share stuff like this on social media, or I could never get up and speak in front of someone. And that, that may be the case with you. Uh, but I would, I would challenge you to share your story as often as you can. And, um, and whether it's on social media or you're just telling somebody when you go out to eat, uh, maybe you're headed to a doctor's appointment and you go get Starbucks after, and you're saying, I'm treating myself to a Starbucks because I just had scans. What do you have scans for? Ocular melanoma. Let me tell you something about it. I always say it's the power of one, of, of one person, one voice. And, and we talked about this prior to the call, actually. It's, it's one person that the ripple effect of that affects another person. That's how Lauren and I got connected. And then look at the impact that she's made just because she and I connected. And uh, the other thing is I, I think education is key. And so I uh, I wish that I could get on the the 
every the Zoom meetings every Tuesday night because I, I think that our support group through Cure Insight is just absolutely amazing. But I go online and I, I see what you post. I, I see the, the videos. I try to get educated so that when people ask me what's going on, I can speak to that. Um, case in point, I actually reached out to, we have a new cancer center here in, in Auburn, Alabama. And actually, it's in Oak Lysa, which is close to us. And uh, we have three new people who were just diagnosed within the last year that live in Auburn who um, who have ocular melanoma. And they have to go other places for treatment. So I found out that the cancer center here has a tumor board that meets once a month. And they invite speakers to come for the first 10 to 15 minutes to speak on something. So in January, I'm coming to speak on what's new. And um the, the go-to treatments that the doctors here want to do with there's, there's a new person being treated here uh, that that may not be the the best choice, but it's because like Lauren said, the doctors don't necessarily know. It's not that they don't want to treat people with oculomelanoma well, it's that they you don't know what you don't know. And so, kind of my thought about this is, okay, what if I was to come in and and share what's new and and use it from the vantage point of of being able to explain what I've gone through and then be able to bring in slides about you know, Chemtrek, about Delcath, about what's going on with IDEA, what's going on with Aura, um, just so many different things that, that you have to be educated to be able to talk about it so that you can give the right information. Uh, so I'm, I'm a big proponent of being able to share. I try to share as much as I can. A lot of it's for my own personal documentation, but, um, but as I share on social media, I found that people will share my posts. And, um, and then just yesterday, literally, I'm not exaggerating, just yesterday, I had three new people who I've never met reach out to me on social media through private messaging saying um, they had questions. All of them had questions, either questions of where to stay in Philly or questions about what kind of treatment they should have. Or what I had one person say, you know, my doctor only wants to do ultrasounds on my liver. What should I do about that? And being able to give information of Dr. Sato's scan protocol, um, which the only reason I have that is because y'all had it posted on a Cure Insights page. <laughs> so I was able to screenshot it. So um, I think just being an advocate, uh, a lot of it is being educated, staying on top of it, and being willing to stand up for yourself. That's the other thing. I tell people, um, this is kind of bizarre, that even when I lived in Memphis and had a really good ocular oncologist there who sent me to an oncologist who did my surveillance, when I moved to Auburn, I met with my doctor here. She was so sweet. I was very overweight at the time, and she actually said to me, she said, you know what, ocular melanoma is not going to be what kills you. You need to work on, you know, not your high cholesterol and, and your weight and whatnot. And I remember going home thinking she has no idea. And then later she read, like, all my, my diagnostic, when it, she finally got all my paperwork, she called me back and said, wow, I just read about this. I had, I had no idea. So um, I, I had to be my own advocate with her. Like, I had to call her every time I knew it was time for scans, her office not one time called me and said, hey, it's time for your scans. When it was three months, I would call and say, hey, I need y'all to schedule my MRIs. And she would absolutely do it. That was her role in my life at the time. But she didn't, her office would never have done that. So I have people every now and then that will say, wow, you know, we, my doctors haven't called me to, to schedule anything. And I want to say, well, be your own advocate. Like, you know, when your scans are due, call your doctor and get them scheduled. Um, unfortunately, with, with the type of cancer we have, we have to do that. So, again, just standing up for yourself, being educated and being um, intentional, recognizing that you are created for impact and, and choosing to walk in, in that path, I think is very important. Oh, my goodness. I'm like, just taking notes from you guys. This is this is awesome. Um, and I just appreciate what you guys are sharing so much. Um, Kristen, I'm going to go ahead and move on to you. What does advocacy look like for you? And I mean, this can, this can be in a, in a, in a personal way and it can also be, you know, the far reaching way. Yeah, no, I think uh, you guys touched on a lot. It's there's education, there's sharing your own experience where we can learn from each other and have safe spaces to engage with one another, one another. And I think part of the thing that shocked me about getting involved with Steps for Sight the first year is how many people wanted to, you know, walk alongside you. And I've felt supported like my whole time in my diagnosis stages. Um, but I think it gives permission to people to get involved with you. And it gives, you know, some people something tan tangible to jump in on. And um, when we share our stories and when we invite people in, um, a big thing I tried to do uh, when I 
go to make my team is kind of recap the year in an email um, of like where I am, what happened last since last time, because not everyone's as comfortable to ask, you know, like, how's it going or follow up and keep close, but it still means a lot to me to share uh, give permission permission to people to you know ask questions to hear how it's going to understand what does it look like in a year like not everyone it's such a rare cancer and it's confusing to a lot of people that we're not living in remission um, but you look at someone like me and I look like I have my normal energy and I'm going out like still keeping my job and doing my full day to day workload um, and so the kind of question out there is what is going on? Um, So I think it is important to kind of note how it does impact you and invite people in to ask questions and share those experiences. Oh, I love that. Um, You guys have all touched on some really powerful points of just what is advocacy? What does it look like? Um, I'm just going to kind of summarize a couple of the things that I heard. Things like being a voice. We have to be a voice. We have to be a voice for ourselves, but also for the other people, the people who maybe are not diagnosed yet and the people who aren't online um we have to be that voice but we also need um to educate ourselves ashley touched on the the important part of knowledge is power and that if we can educate ourselves then we can make sure that other patients are getting the right education that they're getting their information from the right sources um and that they are you know well equipped when things change and they need to pivot um and use that information for different purposes um sharing openly and just being authentic, being authentic with how you share your story and who you share it with. And, and also being, um, intentional, I think is what I'm hearing from Christian is, is, you know, don't, don't assume that people don't want to know if people aren't checking up on you every single minute of every day, maybe it's not because they don't care. Maybe it's because they don't know what to ask and to just really, um, give people the benefit of the doubt because, you know, you're going through this for the first time and everyone around you is going through it for the first time. And so, you know, everybody's kind of their own guinea pig in this situation. Nobody knows what to do. And there's no, we've talked about this before. There's, there's no real right way to do it. And um, there's no rule book that tells you, you know, here's how to do it. Um, we are all really just paving, paving the way on our own. Um, but standing up for yourself was another thing, a, a thing that I heard you guys talk a lot about. And, um, and, and I think Kristen, you have, you have been huge in this for me too, um, in just, in just helping other patients who are maybe newer diagnosed to advocate for themselves more strongly to push for the things that they want. Um, especially if they are younger, uh, as far as, you know, like infertility or, you know, future fertility, um, just making sure that, that you have those opportunities that maybe aren't being asked about because you're not part of the typical demographic of this cancer. And, um, then so those are the things that get overlooked, right? When you're when you're typically a doctor who's treating someone who's a 60, 70 year old, like older, typically like 50 plus percent are of people diagnosed are male, like then they're not thinking about are you gonna have babies one day or are you going to want to before we start you on any of these treatments or anything. Um so just being sensitive to the things that you need. So thank you guys for all sharing about um, just advocacy and, and how that looks for you. And and Kristen, you you started a really good segue into like talking more about steps for sight, which is another one of the reasons that I brought these ladies here. So not only are these patients um, wonderful, impactful, compassionate, and just amazing people um, and who have, you know, just taken tons of steps themselves um, on individual levels and in unique circumstances in unique ways, they have all also been part of Steps for Sight. So if you haven't participated in Steps for Sight with us before, then stay tuned. Uh, We are going to be launching our third Steps for Sight early next week. You'll be able to register for the Steps for Sight teams. And it is just online. It is a virtual walk for ocular melanoma. And we've done it every January for the last two years. This is our third year. And Ashley, Kristen, and Lauren have all been participants with some of the most high, um, high scoring, like, high level, um, like number of participants in their teams, but also they have raised the most money. Um, like they are really some true rock stars in this specific realm of advocacy. So I want to ask you guys, and I'm going to start with you, Kristen, we're going to flip the order here. Um, so Kristen, how has being part of steps for sight the last two years since you were diagnosed affected the way that you view online advocacy and how, how has it just affected, you know, your personal journey and how this looks for you? Yeah, no, um, I, you know, the first year came about 
right after I was diagnosed that same year I was diagnosed. And so I saw it as an opportunity to kind of get involved right away um, and bring people together who had been praying for me all year, who'd been asking what they could do to help. And, you know, having this opportunity of Steps for Sight to have a tangible way for people to learn about um, the Akira Insight community that I got really connected to that year, my Tuesday night um, meetings with everyone to learn about treatments and what else was out there was just the perfect opportunity to dive in. Um, and so the first year came and I was hoping that like maybe 20 people would join with me. And there is like, I don't know, like a good, a good 50 plus people have joined in on my team with me. And, you know, it's a small commitment to walk and log steps on, um, this app. And it's a great excuse, especially in Chicago to, um, get outside in the cold or, you know, do laps around the house. We've done many of those as a family. <laughs> um, and it's what, what a perfect time, you know, people are already thinking about New Year's resolutions. People are coming off the holidays in a spirit of giving. And then for me, it was marking, um, the anniversary of my, um, enucleation and proper diagnosis. So it like fell on my lap as this perfect gift to share with my community. And, um, I, the second year people were asking, they're like, are you going to do it again? Is that coming again in January? And so I'm thrilled that it's something that Karen site has continued to put on. It's such a fun and social activity. Um, there's ways to get involved, like posting photos on the app of where you are walking. And I think that's really cool. Like, as you guys know, from being in this community where it's so rare, patients are like your closest friends are literally spread all over the world. It's cool to see people walking on the beach and then people walking in the snow and <laughs> whatnot. Like everyone's everywhere. Um, but we're doing this together in the month of January. And, and so it's been a challenge that I've really enjoyed. Oh, I love that. Um, Ashley, what about you? You were a part of steps for sight this last year, more recently. I don't, I don't actually remember if you were involved the first year. Um, maybe, maybe you were, you were probably involved in both. <laughs> Let's be honest. I just can't remember the registration list. I just know that I looked at last year and that's where I pulled my list of who do I talk to for today? Well, it's funny because I was like, I'm so competitive that I can remember Kristen like posting about her team. And I was like, I'm every day check the site and see who had given more money and who had done. I was just like, just so uh, empowered by her, her spirit of getting after it that I, I wanted to do that as well. And, um, and so anyway, I will say that, that part of what I did was I invited a lot of people. You know, people want to do something for you. They don't know what to do. And so I think that what a great opportunity to say this is this will do more than just feed my family. This could potentially save the life of somebody. And I'm not trying to be overly dramatic. I mean, for every dollar that we can get, it, it could either go to research or a Karen site has travel um, that some of this money could go to help people travel. And I, I just see it as such a great opportunity to be able to give your money to who you know is going to spend it um, wisely and, and not just um, you know, randomly giving to, to something that you don't really know how that money is going to be spent. And so I, I just really um, reached out. To, for me, I've got to be honest with y'all, um, I was in a, in a state this past year where uh, joint pain was a huge issue for me. Being able, if I got out and walked, that was I was done for the rest of the day. I, I mean, I just my energy was just uh, it was just a very challenging thing. And so initially, when I saw that it was like steps for sight, and maybe there's somebody out there that needs to hear this, I was like, oh, I really can't do that. But what I found is I I was still able to raise a lot of money by by jumping on the bandwagon of hey, can you help give? Can you help give? Or can you walk? And and then like Kristen said, show me the pictures of what you're doing. And um, and I, I was just amazed and humbled, very humbled by how many people uh, just joined in because they want to do something. They want to make a difference. And, and I, I have a very strong support group, a, a lot of people who, who support me and support my family. And uh, uh, people were thrilled to be able to do it. And so I'm excited about doing that again this year. Hopefully I'll be able to actually do the steps and whatnot. I got like one of those, uh, I'm getting one of those um, things where you can walk in your house. It's not like a treadmill, but it's like a, I don't even know what you call them, but that's kind of a Christmas gift I've asked for. And so I'm looking forward to doing some steps and being able to raise money again this year 
it makes a huge difference. Oh, that's so powerful. And I love that you brought in the idea that, you know, if you cannot walk yourself, if it's physically not something that you can do, that does not mean that you're eliminated from being part of this movement. It doesn't exclude yeah. you. Um, you can still ask for people to walk for you. And isn't that kind of the point, right? You're the cancer patient. Like if you are the yeah. patient listening to this call, you're the one who this cancer affects and you walk with ocular melanoma every single day of your life. You don't need another reminder of that, but it's asking for your people, right? Asking for your tribe, your, your, your community far and wide online and in person to support you and to walk for you, to walk with you in mind, to walk with ocular melanoma in mind and how impactful and special. And I mean, like Lauren, you're making me cry. I'm like watching you. I'm like, no, I can't look at Lauren. Don't look at Lauren. She's going to make me cry, but how impactful and special and, and, encouraging to you as a patient could that be for your community to come together the way they did for Kristen or for Ashley or for Lauren and for you to know that not only did you bring those people together but that all of them are there for you and because yeah. they want a future they want a future that you're in it mm. um mm. oh okay all right so Lauren mm -hmm. I'm gonna move over to you real quick you participated in Steps for Sight with us last year, and you had a pretty pretty large team. Um, you raised a significant amount of money. So, how did that kind of shift your um, shift your beliefs of, of what is what is advocacy, and how I guess just how did it how did it affect well, your online me, advocacy? I'm always trying to raise money for a cure in sight, and and I always yeah. when I talk to people, it's about you know as we say this is a we it's about us. And how I tell people how a cure in sight, we do funding for patients to get to treatment for food, maybe pay their mortgage for the month. You know, we're trying to raise money to help people get to the treatment they need. When people, like you guys are saying, like Kristen, you were saying earlier, people look at us, we look fine. And, and especially, yeah. I don't have metastatic disease. But I'm, we're all time bombs, right? We're we're all waiting for that shoe to drop. And we keep sh suiting up and showing up for our lives. So, you know, the further I get away from being diagnosed, but I'm still, listen, I'm at the ocular oncologist once a month. The people don't know I'm getting treated every month. They don't know what I'm walking through. And I have to remind them, but I have to let them know what we do as a team at a cure in sight and how we're impacting everyone else around us. We do patient meetings. We're doing the, the funding for patients, the cure companions, you know, all those things, but we need funding to help help our people. Yeah, for you sure. Know? So as far as I go, I mean, like I've got that, plus I'm, we're doing a walk in, in Miami. In, um, and I'm trying to Ooh, call businesses for money for that, you know, so it's a constant, it's always it's, letting yeah, people know what's going on. So you I know, guess what every, I'm like, no, one more thing, everyone you meet, everyone you meet, you know, everyone you meet, we don't know where we're meeting. They might have a family member that that's died from a, from ocular melanoma or or is battling or has just found something in their eye and they know nothing about it. Everyone we tap, you know, it's that salesperson, you know, everyone you meet is a prospect. Everyone you meet is somebody that can help you make a difference. And, and Ashley had said that earlier, you know, it's a, it's a wave. And so I just, my cell phone is a plethora of people. I just send out the text. And I'm like, I need you, please help me, you know? And that's what I do. So. I love it. Lauren, and you're, you're just, you're so like, I know that you're so passionate about it, but you're also just like, it's, it's not, it's not complicated, right? That it's this simple thing. Like it, if we make it complicated, sure, it can become complicated, but it doesn't have to be. It can be as simple as doing what Kristen or Lauren have done. Send out a text, post something on Facebook, Find the people that you are the most closely connected for or to and ask them, can you please help me to share this? Can you find people who you know are already going to be being involved in some level of physical activity in, the, in January with New Year's goals, New Year's resolutions anyway? So why not do this, right? What's it going to hurt? Mm -hmm. um, the other, you know, kind of things to think about is, 
is that um, you guys have all kind of talked about this. Uh, you've hinted at it, but it's the idea that it's it's really pretty simple, right? That there's a simple a simple app that it connects with your phone or it connects with your watch. That is, it's just pre. It, you're you're already tracking your steps because your watch does it for you. It's not like you have to manually go in and input it every single time. And even if you did have to manually enter your steps on any capacity, it really doesn't take a whole lot of time in the app. It's called the Charity Footprints app. Um, but that aside, the investment is small, right? It's a it's a 25, 35, whatever the, the registration fee is. Um, it's a pretty small investment as, as far as this goes. And it's just asking them to be part of it with you, but also um, to consider donating on top of that, to be part of a larger movement um, and to just help them understand the impact that that could have. And I love what Lauren said about talking about our programs. And Ashley, you talked about this too. We've got our programs of financial aid. We have opportunities where we are helping patients to get to primary and to metastatic treatment, but we also do have our research fund. And that research fund only can gather enough money to actually fund a significant research project that's going to help real living people when it you know, gets to the certain threshold that we can actually use to invest it. And so those kinds of numbers, helping people understand within your community that, hey, you're being you're being a part of this movement with me by donating, by helping me share this fundraiser. Um, that's that's kind of the the end goal is to help people understand that we're all in this together, right? And Lauren, you've said this so many times and I'm gonna just keep piggybacking off of it, but it's it's kind of what our theme, it's not not kind of, it is our theme for 2024, um, which, you know, those of you listening live, you get a sneak peek, but our theme next year is better together, like better together, because we are always going to be stronger if we come together as patients, when we come together at events, when we come together for things like Steps for Sight, and we just unite across the world to show them, hey, ocular melanoma is here, pay attention and help and help make an impact in this sphere because we need it. We patients need it. The patients who come after us need it. And we need you to understand the gravity of that. Um, but the other side of it is awareness for eye exams and how you know the eye exam that we tell people, please get your eyes dilated. Well, the eye dilation is great, but so many people think that they can just get out of it by taking the pictures or that if they get their eyes dilated, that means they don't need the pictures all of my doctors are pretty confident that had I had the photos taken every single year, we would have seen my tumor six months to a year prior than it ever affected vision. Um, but I never had the pictures taken because they were always framed as an inconvenience. So this idea that the eye exam is always going to be better together. Dilation with photos, they are better together. They don't mutually exclude each other. Um, so sneak peek into that theme. We're going to be talking about that a lot next year. So get used to that. <laughs> Um, and as my eye starts to like, try to have a mind of its own. Um, so you guys are seriously, some of, some of the most empowering people. And I just want to read off one of the comments, um, that came in through the chat. So that, uh, as we, as we kind of look at this, but I think this is a, this is a, a good question to, to start with. She says, you all are so encouraging and inspiring. So thank you for all you're doing. I'm seven months into this journey. Um, and I do not have metastases, but I am at the highest risk for this. I would love to advocate in some way, but I haven't quite figured out how to get started with it and how to figure out my own personal way of doing this. Do you have any recommendations for someone who's mulling this over as to how to find that way of, you know, advocating in a way you're comfortable with and have it be effective? Um, Ashley, can I start with you? Yes. Yeah. Let me make sure I'm on. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Yes. So I was just going to say a um, couple things. One, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So you, you have this with the care insight that's coming up. And if you want to, to just jump on to what they're going to be doing in January, it'll all be set up for you. It'll be a great way. Matter of fact, if, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, Danae, I, thought, I, feel, I feel like in the past y'all have given like something that can be shared on social media. If it's not every day, it's, it's something um, definitely weekly that you'd be able to share that way. I want you to have the mindset that if you um, ask a little, you can get a lot. And what I mean by that is, um, I don't know, I don't have 5,000 friends, but somehow there's 5,000 people supposedly on my friend base for Facebook. And one of the things that I put out there was, you know, if, if everybody who followed me on Facebook only gave five, five dollars, I mean, that's $25,000 that could be raised. And so giving people permission to give a little, you'll be shocked at how many people will go, 
well, you know, I can do $5 or I could do $10 or $20 or whatever it is you want to start with. Um, but also, uh, what is something that you enjoy? Because this is something I just started. This is new off the press to me. Nobody knows this. Um, but I, what therapy for me and, and actually something that Danae and I've talked about recently is just kind of on um, working on yourself and on, on just your healthy mindset going through all this. And I enjoy painting. I'm not very good at it, but I enjoy painting. So I have recently come up with uh, 60 different small paintings, four by six paintings. And as a Christian, um, I get a lot of my, my strength from from God speaking to me through his word. So these, these paintings, I've put verses on, and I've started selling them. Um, I've been selling them locally, uh, and I put them in a frame. That you get 12 cards, so one for each month, and you can just switch it out in the frame. And, um, and I'm raising money that way to be able to hopefully give to a bigger organization. Um, and so this is just something I enjoy doing. And uh, maybe you have something that you're good at, like Lauren shared the necklace that this young lady is making. And, and when she, she sells them, she's raising awareness. So maybe there's something that you enjoy um, that, that you could do. Or uh, I do have a friend who um, one of the things that they, they've done their lemonade stands. I have another friend who um, their kids babysat. And as they babysat, instead of them keeping the money, they gave money to a cure in sight. So there's all different ways that you can just get creative to come up with a way. It may not be walking for you, but it could be something else that you're good at. Um, and it may be, too, I just want to tell you this as well. Don't feel awkward about asking for money. People always are like, oh, you don't feel obligated to do something like this. I, I get that kind of approach. But uh, I think it's okay for you to be able to say, look, this is something that, like, we're passionate about. This is something that has affected me, obviously, very deeply. And if you would like to help, um, we, we don't get a whole lot of money for, for research or for anything, for that matter, is it being an orphan cancer and being able to tell, hey, the little bit of money that you could give can make a huge impact in the life of another person. I think that that is key. Um, give, your permi give yourself permission to ask. Because people want to do, they want to help, they just don't know how. So oh, I, would, I love that. I would strongly... Ashley, that was so powerful. Thank you so much. Um, and I am um, just for the sake of time, I'm going to actually go through this next kind of this next question. Um, and I'm going to just kind of let, you know, volunteer, whoever thinks that they want to take this question, go for it and just raise your hand and volunteer. Um, but uh, why? Well, and you know what, if you don't mind, actually, Kristen, can I ask you this question about what do you yeah. think made your team so successful in being a part of, of your, your steps for site team this last couple of years, because your team has been the largest team. It's been one of the largest fundraising teams two years in a row. So obviously you're doing something right, um, mm -hmm. within your community. Um, but what do you think made you guys so successful? Um, I think, you know, the community can start small and then really just explode from there. I really kind of wanted to get involved with my other Acure Insight friends and wanted to see us all start this walk together. And, um, you know, it prompted me to make a team and invite members to my team. And in that moment, I was like, oh, well, who would my team be? And I shared it with like my close family, word kind of spread, went to cousins, went to, um, you know, friends and on to there. And I'm blessed that my family, um, boyfriend's family and friends are so competitive that they love the leaderboard and <laughs> they, they love to really get involved and compete with each other. And so I think that's why, um, we are <laughs> successful as a team is people love to get involved and it's a fun, it's really a fun activity in January to, um, you know, having conversation. Like I said, Chicago is really cold and really dull in January. We're already tired of winter. So it's a fun challenge to, you know, be like, hey, we're doing steps for sight together. Let's let's go on a walk together. I didn't get my steps in yet for today. And I think it's it's a big community thing in like in part of you know the larger meaning as well mm -hmm. um so there's a lot of unique ways to look at it and get involved um and yeah you can start small start with like your other friends like a couple friends and you compete with each other on the leaderboard post some pictures on the on the charity footprint social and see where everyone's walking um and then yeah invite people to partner with you and i think it would be important to you to call out that um for anyone listening uh don't feel like you missed 
miss the boat at like come January 2nd. Like it's a, it's all, it's going on all month. So um, yeah, no, that's such a good point to, to join in. So um, let's just like briefly touch on why, why did you fundraise? Um, like those of you, all of you guys have raised money through various different avenues for ocular melanoma research for patient programs and patient aid, you know, whether it's for a cure in sight or other avenues, it doesn't really matter. But like when you have fundraised for steps for sight, let's just maybe narrow it down to there. Like, why was it important to you to ask? Like, Ashley, you made the point of like, you know, let's, let's not assume that we shouldn't ask, but why did you personally decide that asking was important for you? Well, for me personally, um, you see, so you see October, of course, we have Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and you see everybody in, in the whole community is wearing pink. You have National Football League having pink socks on and all these things, and, and we don't have that. And so I'm, I'm very quick to, to let people know um, that, that I have a little bit of envy about that, <laughs> that I, I wish that more, more money was being able to be given. And then when I see, when I'm able to come along and say, now look at us, uh, two years later, we've got these, you know, FDA approved drugs that have come out. Um, the only reason that has happened is because money was made available. So I can actually speak to that after, you know, being on two, two clinical trials, y'all being on a clinical trial, the only way that this even comes to be is because of clinical trials. And so for me, I, I was very passionate about sharing that I was, I was a part of a trial. The only way that happens is through research dollars. And that if you want to see somebody like me be able to live my best life and as long as I can, um, I, I just I had no problem asking for that because yeah. we, we need more research. If I have research, we need more money. No, so, such uh, a good I'm point. Pretty- it's so simple too. So Kristen, mm-hmm. when you have done, like when you have asked on social media, I've seen you posted a few different types of ways. So what are some of the ways that you've posted about your fundraiser or about your team? Yeah, um, I think, you know, I've taken it upon myself to kind of do a screen recording, share at the start of, you know, how to like really use the technology and join um, so people know what they're looking for. That's important to me that, you know, just the link to join isn't so intimidating, but people have technical questions. They understand I know what's going on so they can reach out to me and kind of see the path um, onto the app. Um, but then also too, I think it's it's fun to show where I'm walking. And, um, you know, sometimes I try to reflect on what January was like at the time of diagnosis and touch on um some of those points in my like social media share. It's like, hey, this time January of 2021 is when I was headed to Philly to meet with Dr. Shields for the first time. And it is a really unique um, uh, look back of where mm-hmm. the month falls um, because January was when like everything happened really quickly. Um, and so, yeah, I, I kind of make it personal, but also practical. Um, it's It's fun to, you know, I make on like an Instagram, I have a little story collage of where I'm saving some of these um, posts over the month of January. And it's, it's fun to go back to and yeah, yeah. and just reflect and kind of share the diary, so to speak of like where mm-hmm. you were and where you've come. Lauren, what about you? Um, when you have fundraised for various different events for, uh, for a cure in sight, what are some of the ways that you have fundraised? Like, is it just word of mouth? Have you been able to make phone calls? Um, I really want to just try to make this accessible so that people can see there are so many different ways you can do this. So first of all, um, when I first, my first fundraiser for Cure Insight was when I met Ashley and it was eye patch days. And so I did a video and I was on Facebook and, and um, then a few years, a year later, I went on uh, our local TV and did, I asked for people to, you know, um, eye patch days come out. I did a luncheon with uh, girls, um, asked them to bring money, you know, for eye patch days, and they all had to wear an eye patch. I did an eye patch walk where people had to uh, either, uh, they had to uh, wear their best eye patch or they drove a golf cart with uh, um, where their golf carts were dressed as eye patches. I swear to, it was, it was awesome. Um, so I try to make it fun and unique, um, mm. uh, as you know, there's, I just want to say one thing, 
you were saying how this is better together, right? This is, we're doing this together. And as I started at the beginning, I was alone in this. You know, I had family, yes, but I didn't have a support system. For all of you that are out there, we are so blessed. We have each other. You are never alone again with this. We are here for you. Remember that. Um, we are here to support you in any way we can. And so when I'm asking for support for uh, Steps for Sight or uh, a 5K or uh, Swing for Sight in April or whatever it is, this isn't about me. It's about us. It's about the future. It's about patients who, who need our help and that are struggling and they can't get to their treatment. And some of them, we've lost some of them because they never could make it out of their state. So this is, you know, baby steps, right? My husband always tells me baby steps. <laughs> so for the woman who said, how do I start? First of all, you're, you're on here. So you're starting, you're getting connected. Um, Tuesday nights, we have a support group, please come. Um, as Ashley said, find your passion, what makes you happy. Maybe it's yoga, maybe it's walking, maybe it's golfing, may whatever it is, dancing, aerobics, what whatever it is, and start with the, your passion. And my passion is people. And my passion is making a difference. And, and my passion is taking every opportunity that that is presented to me that is a challenge and making an opportunity to help others. And that's my passion. So right. I'm going to leave you with that. I love all of you. Thank you so much for inviting me to her today. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Happy holiday. It's been absolutely wonderful having all of you guys here. So we're not going to go into a big, long, you know, why spiel. I think it's pretty obvious. You guys are probably all going to do Steps for Sight again. Um, so by show of hands, who is going to participate in Steps for Sight 2024? Okay. I'm going to be telling my people. You guys are going to tell your people. If you're on live, this is your, your mission is to now tell someone else, some other ocular melanoma patient. When you see our posts, I see a couple of virtual hands raised. <laughs> um, but when you see our posts, right, when you see me post from a Kieran Sites page or you see this 12 days of sight, any of the awareness posts that we put out, please share them. Um, we had a post go viral on Instagram one time because people just took the initiative to share. And it was it's those kinds of things, that simple share and just trusting that those baby steps all add up and that that we really, truly are better together. We're better when we act together with with. And I would say we're better when we act as a team or, you know, with each other in mind. Right. And it's, it's kind of like what, what, um, uh, Ashley, what Kristen, what Lauren, you guys have all touched on this, that you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing this because it's important to you, but it's also important to the future of all of the other patients that you have met or haven't met yet because they haven't been diagnosed yet. And like, what a profound way to live your life. Um, and, and, and I would argue you guys still have, you still have everyday normal lives. Like you're not, this is not, your all consuming. It doesn't take over your life. It doesn't take over your day job. Kristen can, Kristen can work full time. Ashley, you're still taking care of all these crazy fun family events. You're doing weddings. You're, you're handling all of the things that happen in your phase of life. And you're also here and you're also part of steps for sight, or you're part of a 5k when it's happening in your area, you're here. And just because you're a part of something with us and you're a part of this community with us doesn't mean that it encroaches upon your whole life. It's really, I would, I would argue this is, this is the kind of thing, this is the kind of mission and passion and purpose that like Ashley said, when we are, when we realize and we, we recognize that we are all wired for impact, we're created for having this impact. We want that. We want to have a legacy and a lasting impact. And when we recognize that we can have that by just being a small part of sharing of being uh you know in an event of fundraising on a birthday fundraiser on Facebook all of those are just simple little ways that you are contributing and giving back and if you can frame it in a way that this is helping someone else that whether it's that you're sharing your story for the first time publicly or on social media and that someone else might just reach out and say hey I'm so glad you posted because I was diagnosed you know 20 years ago and I've never found anyone until today like that was something that happened to me. I had a patient who she's been on Facebook for years and somehow has never come across an ocular melanoma patient except 
for when she was tagged in my post by a friend. So there's just, there's so many ways that we can be an impact. And I, I really, I, I want to, um, I guess I don't want to just end what I'm going to say before I let you guys uh, end with each, just, I want you each to share. So be thinking about this while I finish. Um, everybody, let's just end with, let's, let's just end with what's your one holiday wish, like one holiday wish you have going into next year for the future of ocular melanoma, um, for patients, for treatments. Um, what do you hope? So, um, I guess I would, I would hope that we can all recognize what Ashley said, that we were all created for impact and we all have the ability to make an impact and for it to be profound in our sphere. Um, so Lauren, what would your, what would your holiday wish be? First, I want to say, Danae, thank you. I love you. You're a rock star and you're awesome. So thanks for all you do for us. Um, a cure. Love for us to find a cure. Kristen, what about you? Yeah, um, can't go wrong there. But I would say specifically, I feel like I, I really hope that patients feel seen in the new year. Um, I feel like I am very blessed, like Ashley, to have HLA positive and that can track accessible to me. But I do see frustration um, from other patients who don't get that option um, or, you know, who want to see more at the adjuvant stage, not just at the time of metastasis. Um, so I'm, I'm seeing a lot of advances in this year alone. I'm excited to see more. I love that. Ashley, what about you? I would definitely want to encourage everybody to, to not live in fear because fear can drive your behavior to be things that, that are not necessary. Like you said, that this, this cancer does not define us. None of us are promised tomorrow. I'm, I'm sitting in the middle of a parking lot shopping and I'm not even guaranteed I can get home today. So my, my wish is that people would um, just embrace the day and, and live in the moment, um, make the most of every opportunity, make the biggest impact you can on other people, um, and just and know that you're not alone. Um, and don't let the fear or anxiety about scans or the what if or if the shoe could drop or when it could or whatever, don't let that be what um, that steals your joy. There's just yeah, so much that. more than us being worried or anxious about what's going to happen next. We have such a gift in the moment. And so enjoy that. I love that. You guys are all so incredible. Thank you again for our live, our live audience who's been on live. This is recorded. So I will make sure to get this recording up to you guys as soon as I can next week. Please watch social media and share our posts about Steps for Sight when you see that that is live. Um, I have a little bit more work to do to get that all the way up and running. Uh, but between Melody and I and the rest of you guys helping to share, it will get out there and um, share it with your friends across the world. This is not just United States. We want the entire world walking for ocular melanoma starting January 1st, 2024. So thank you guys for being here. Thank you for being such powerful advocates. Thank you guys for tuning in and please share this video when you see it. And um, we will see you guys when we start Steps for Sight. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, guys.